Welcome to the Porch Roof Classic, a retro baseball podcast novel in 15 or so episodes by Jeff Pullman. Episode 4 I was wrong about Camp Manka Lake. It wasn't a prison at all. It wasn't even that Jewish. I must have seen at least three kids wearing crucifixes the first day. The camp was also in a pastoral part of the Berkshires that took Dad at least an hour and a half to get to up an endless ribbon of hilly roads. He wasn't used to driving that far into the country, and I could tell because he uttered, Who boy, every time we rounded a sharp curve. A battalion of counselors greeted me and a few dozen other arrivals at the gravel parking lot. Most were college age with big creepy smiles and separated us by gender right away. From what I could see, the boy-girl ratio was close to 50-50. Behave yourself and use your bug stuff, was the only thing my dad offered as he gave me a stiff goodbye hug. The only time I had been gone from home without my folks was on sleepovers in a handful of neighborhood friends' houses. The thought of two whole weeks away made me excited and nervous. Team Chet was our 16-kid camp group named after Chet Hiller, a chiseled blonde Dartmouth jock who marched us to a wooded area near the lake. I was lodged in a large and musty canvas tent with three other rookies, Barry, a mousy kid with braces swallowing his mouth and non-stop snot dripping from a nostril, Fred from Yonkers, tall and vulgar and sporting the biggest Jufro I'd ever seen, and Noah Whites, who had asthma and never said a word, and read pirate adventure books every idle second from a library of them he'd stuffed into his bag. They served us hot dogs and potato chips that night in the Mac Corral, an old wooden dining hall that smelled like smoke and cleaning products. The girl campers occupied three long tables across the room. When we entered, they were already seated and halfway through their meal. It was pretty obvious they would be leaving the hall first. The college girl counselors and a handful of older anti-types seemed to want as little contact as possible between the young genders. Yonkers' Fred wasn't phased, though. Spent most of the dinner sizing up and commenting on the best girl campers he could see from his seat. That one's for me. Who, asked Barry, eyes popped. The blonde one with the ponytail? No, dummy, with the brown hair and bazookas, and the face like Jacqueline Bissett. Jackie who? Forget it. Ain't nobody you're going to date. Ooh, you see what she did? Did she wink at you? Better. She ate her hot dog super slow in my direction. No way. Damn straight way. By the fourth or fifth Freddy fantasy sighting, I'd had enough. Noah had brought an old Classics Illustrated comic of Kidnapped along and stayed buried in it when I tried to have a conversation with him. It was almost a relief when the girl suddenly filed out. See you soon, ladies, said Fred, quiet enough so only we heard it. Many of the boys paused, their chowing to take in the grand exit, but most of the girls avoided eye contact. A few of them shyly smiled. The rest chattered away with their tent mates to avoid the temptation of eye contact. Chet gave us a 10 p.m. curfew to turn off our lanterns, but that didn't matter to Yonkers Fred. He spent three minutes describing the ass of a girl he saw at the camp a year ago, five minutes describing the red gumdrop of a nipple he saw while staring down a girl's shirt at synagogue, and ten minutes outlining his foolproof plans for leading a panty raid on one of the girl tents in the next two weeks, complete with escape routes through the trees that he drew with his finger in a moonlit spot on our dusty wood floor. That one with the brown hair? I'll have her coo smell in my top drawer at home the rest of the summer. Whoa, said Barry. Back in your bags, yelled Chet from his, and we scrambled into them. You, my brown-haired girl, sang Fred in his worst Van Morrison. Barry giggled, snorted up some goodnight phlegm, and while my brain scanned the cutest girl faces I could recall from dinner, mixed in with Melanie Court, of course, one of my hands made its way down my belly and into my underwear to get friendly. From what I heard in our tent the next five or so minutes, this was contagious. The water was dark green and smelled like Grandma Sadie's garbage can when she forgot to throw out turkey innards two days after Thanksgiving. The lake was undoubtedly filled with poisonous snakes, biting fish, and several species of slime. At eight in the morning, it was also freezing. 
A little nipply out, wouldn't you say? announced Yonkers Fred, gazing across the little wood dock at a row of girls wearing identical orange rubber bathing caps and mismatched suits. Like us and four other boy teams, they'd been extracted from their snuggly sleeping bags at 7.30 a.m. A loud whistle pierced our eardrums. Good morning, Macalakers. I'm swimming coach Rudy. Rudy was six foot two, built like Max Baer, a famous Jewish heavyweight boxer from the 1930s I'd read about, and barked everything through a megaphone that was completely unnecessary. I only have one lesson to teach you about swimming. Be aware and pay attention. Aren't those the same thing? I uttered to Noah. You, yelled Rudy, pointing at me. What did I just say? Uh, be aware? No, pay attention. Barry giggled. Fred was oblivious, staring at the little round protrusions on the front of brown-haired girl's yellow and blue swim top, even though we were a good twenty yards away. Stay with your swim buddy, because he or she will save your life if you swallow too much lake water and begin to sink. That shut all of us up. One of the girls even gasped. Now on the count of three, I want all of you campers to jump in, locate your buddy, and dog paddle together to get your body used to the water. It's cold, but won't kill you. Ready now? He counted and blew the whistle. We jumped. It was like landing in borscht, cold and gross, and filled with unseen tendrils tickling our legs. I knew immediately why a few kids at dinner were calling the place Camp Muckalake. Barry was my buddy, and I was grateful to be in water in case he had to grab me, because it meant a snot-free hand. We dog paddled for a few minutes after the initial shock to our systems. Nearly all the girls on the other side of the swimming area were yelping, trying to chatter through chattering teeth, except for one. She had black hair made even blacker by the water, and because she had decided to yank off her bathing cap. She was much paler than the others, and had dark, soulful eyes turned in my direction. Her legs churned up bubbles, keeping her upper torso afloat with little effort inside what looked like an old-fashioned one-piece suit. "'Young lady, put your cap back on!' She glanced up at Rudy, made a defiant face, and spoke in a harsh tone. "'Can't be done. It fell off.' Rudy had a tough time processing this. He lowered his megaphone a moment, then raised it again. "'How did it fall off?' The girl shrugged. "'It just did. I can dive to the bottom of the lake and look for it if you want.' No, just get another one for tomorrow. She winked at him, did a little somersault in the water, and then reached behind with both hands to slick back her mane. I noticed she also had hairy armpits. After a lunch of tuna fish sandwiches and mealy apples, the consorts took us on a two-mile hike. Macalake Falls was supposedly on top of a winding rocky trail, but the first time we attempted the climb, I wasn't sure any of us would survive. The heat and mosquitoes were brutal, even for those of us, like me, covered in off, and every switch in the trail took another gallon of oxygen out of our lungs. "'Almost at the top!' cried Chet about nine times, and marched way ahead of us with an idiotic smirk on his face. We knew the trail was only two miles long, but it felt like forever. Yonkers Fred was so out of breath he couldn't even talk about girls. We stopped to drink from our dorky plastic canteens a few times, but the sun had warmed the water inside, and a few of us had to spit out dead gnats that had gotten in. The falls at the top were actually a half dozen little boulders with a trickle of water leaking through them. Local juveniles had clogged it with empty soda cans. Barry puked tuna fish all over one of the larger rocks, and we moved away from him while Chet patted his back. It did give me a chance to take in the view. The dark green lake shone below, but leafy hills rolled for miles and miles beyond, and a couple of blue peaks grayed some low clouds. I'd never been in anything like this wilderness, and it was enchanting. They wouldn't dare call it nap time, but that's what it turned out to be. Fred and Barry were snoring on their bags moments after we crawled back in the tent. Noah got into another pirate book, in between hits off his inhaler, and I wrote a couple of letters. Hi, Mom. Well, I survived the first couple of days. We swam in the lake this morning and went on a tough but fun hike later that had an incredible view at the top. The food is yummy, and I like my tent roommates. One of them brought a bunch of stuff to read, and I wish I had too. Maybe you can mail me a few of my comic books? Say hello to Dad for me. Joey. Hi, Robbie. 
This place blows and the lake is cold and gross like you probably figured. Only good thing so far is there's a bunch of cute girls to look at. Have you been feeling better since your tree thing? Write back if you can and fill me in on how the Red Sox are. There's no way to get the scores or standings up here, and I'm dying to know if the Orioles are still winning. Love, Joey. An early thunderstorm kept everyone in their tents the next morning, but the sun was out by 1 p.m. and it was time for archery. I always thought learning how to shoot a bow and arrow was a strange activity. It wasn't a skill we would need in the real world, and there weren't exactly arrow shooting halls downtown where we could have a few beers and make bets with other archers. The worst part of archery was I was I was real bad at it, like my half-assed attempt at learning the violin for two weeks in fourth grade. I just couldn't hold the damn bow right. The archery instructor was a husky, man-like college girl named Fran, who wore her long hair back in a thick medieval braid and let out a loud whoop every time someone's arrow landed within a few inches of the bullseye. My first attempts were disasters and sent squirrels ducking for cover in the patch of woods behind the targets. "'What do they call you, Sonny?' Fran asked me from halfway across the clearing, her arms folded. "'Uh, Joey? And what team? Chet. Okay. And did Team Chet get served oatmeal with raisins and nuts this morning? Uh, yeah. And did Joey of Team Chet finish his oatmeal with raisins and nuts? Yep. Well, you fooled me. Fetch your arrows, get back in the line, and watch the others.' I handed the bow to Barry and retrieved my wayward arrows from the woods, which took a few minutes. I felt like an idiot and really hated being called Sonny. We were in the same line as the boys from Team Greg, with Team Sally and Ursula a few yards away. Yonkers Fred was missing the target, too, not because he was a spaz, but because Team Ursula was a little too distracting for him. Whoop! Whoop! Fran's double whoop suddenly froze us in our tracks. We looked right and saw a black-haired girl calmly load and fire arrow after arrow at the center of the bullseye. The first three hit the blue ring, the fourth hit red, and the last one stuck in the yellow. Everyone cheered and applauded, and I got a better look at her. It was the girl from swimming with the dark, soulful eyes who looked at me before yanking off her bathing cap. She handed her bow to the next girl, gave a mock curtsy to the approving crowd, and retreated to the back of the line without even bothering to retrieve her prize arrows. Fran was so impressed, she hurried up and fetched them for her. Wow, not sure I've ever seen a three-whooper, but that was close. Fine shooting, Helen. I stared at the girl in awe, as many of us did. She hung her head a moment and took a deep breath, then proudly raised it again, brushed the wavy hair back off her face, as if ready for her next challenge. My final two archery rounds were worse than my first, and as the teams left the clearing to head back to their tents, Fran took me aside. Practice is everything in life, Joe. It's Joey. Right. Shoot another five or ten, please, before you head back. You know, I couldn't sew a button on a shirt until my mom made me do it all night. She gave me a chummy wink and went off with the others. I groaned. I had developed a blister on my right index finger and my shoulders ached. An afternoon nap beckoned. Mosquitoes found me, drawn to my sweat. I trudged back into the wood patch to get my arrows, forgot exactly what poison ivy looked like, and suddenly didn't care. Make fear your target. I spun around. Dark-haired and darker-eyed Helen addressed me from halfway across the clearing, where she had hung back. What'd you say? She threw all of her hair over one shoulder and walked towards me. There was a graceful, confident stroll to her movements. She was wrong. Made in, fr made in Fran of Camelot, I mean. You don't aim at the bullseye. You aim at fear. Fear? Yep. Fear of people watching. Fear of failing or pissing or crapping your pants or saying or doing the wrong thing. Face it, kiddo. Fear will beat you every time if you let it. Grab the bow. I didn't really like being called kiddo either, but Helen in that moment could have gotten away with calling me Joey Bishop. I quickly found the last arrow and ran back to pick up my bow. She curled her mouth into a warm smile and put out her hand. Joey, right? Yeah. And Helen? Helen Fishblatt. A pleasure. I didn't visibly react to her odd name, but my two-second pause was enough for her to pick up on. I know, it's weird. I tried to change it once, but there was already someone named Rachel Fishblatt. Grab an arrow. I had one across my bow and took my stance. Helen slid behind me. She had washed her hair with some kind of earthy shampoo that smelled all cinnamony, like holiday potpourri. 
All right. Now kick every stupid fear out of your head and focus on the bullseye. Okay. Get them all. If not, if there's any left, stick them on the bullseye because you're going to impale those punks. I drew back the arrow. She put one hand on my gut and the other on my spine. Back straight now. Okay, it is. Your mom's yelling at you to pick up your room, and that's her dead center with a yellow face. But she wouldn't. I always, then it's the dirty dishes. We're playing here, Joey. You're afraid to talk back to her, and there's that fear now, big and ugly and right in the middle, so shoot it. I squinted at the target and shot. The arrow stuck its landing on the outer edge of the blue circle. Hey, she cried, you're an archer. I rapidly went through my four other arrows, Helen backing away a bit further each time. The first hit the woods again, but then I pinned Danny Blight's smug face to the bullseye and hit the red ring with all three. Helen didn't whoop at all, but grinned and gave me a solid victory hug. She was definitely a few years older than me, at least sixteen, and had actual breasts I could feel against my t-shirt. Ahem, Miss Fishblatt! It was Fran, waving her out of the clearing. Thanks for the lesson and all, I said. She gave my arm a gentle squeeze. See you at grub time. And strolled away, still unhurried, still confident. There was an old limpy guy who cleaned out the camp latrines named Randolph, spent most of each day hanging out in a tiny cabin he must have occupied since 1947 because it was filled with everything he owned, wrinkled shirts on homemade racks, cartons of books and papers stacked to the ceiling, canned food, a hot plate, icebox, and most important, a little shortwave radio. He wasn't half as creepy as Mr. Bajorek, and when I walked by his open door later on the way to the Mac Corral for dinner, I thought I heard the faint sounds of a baseball game. The radio broadcaster's voice was a familiar high-pitched Bronxian whine. I rapped on the cabin screen door. Is that who I think it is? Randolph was dozing with a cold can of something in his hand and woke with a start. Yep, the scooter. You a Yanks fan? I was so desperate for baseball news I had to lie. Ever since Maris hit 61, how are they doing? He unhooked a microphone from a stand and coughed into it. Hey, Maynard, what's the score? There was a pause and another guy's voice squawked something back that was impossible to understand. Randolph nodded and hung the mic back up. We're down four to two in the eighth. Who was that? Maynard, pal of mine in Schenectady. Used to go to the stadium with him in the early 50s. Shortwave here, can't tune in WPIX, so he puts AM radio up to his ham for me when he can. Lately, it's been a lot, because I think we got a puncher's chance again. The crowd noise rose for a second, then abruptly died. He pounded a fist on the arm of his old rocker. Damn it. Mercer and Munson both pop homers, and Johnny Ellis does squat. Hate that guy. Um, who we playing? Boston. Peters shut our asses out yesterday, so we need this one. Really? I mean, yeah, I haven't caught any scores at all since I got here. How did Boston do in those four games with the Orioles this week? He scratched an unshaven cheek. Split him, I think. Birds are still three up on us like ten on them. No need to worry about them Boston bums this year. Five hundred club. I heard Rizzuto mention Tony Canigliero's name when he let off the Red Sox ninth. Mind if I listen for a few? Be my guest. I sat on a little log step in front of the cabin. Grub could wait. The Sox pulled out the game 5-3. to three. I shared some fake sadness with Randolph and then Maynard before racing over to the Mac Corral with a few extra springs in my step. Dinner was meatloaf and mashed potatoes, which tasted like what I imagined dog food and congealed saliva tasted. I was so late I got the final cold serving but wolfed it all down anyway. I guess the camp strategy was to wear us out in nature so we were willing to eat garbage. I sat with silent, kidnapped, addicted Noah and scanned the girl's side of the room, but didn't see Helen. Most of the females had already left. I nudged him. Hey, did anyone come over and ask for me before? Like who? Like a girl with long, dark hair? Noah shook his head, returned to his graphic, swashbuckling novel. You've been listening to The Porch Roof Classic by Jeff Pullman. This retro baseball podcast novel was made possible by Spotify for Podcasters and Buzzsprout. Be sure to basket catch another episode next week.
Feel free to rate and review this podcast on whatever platform you're using. Also, if you'd like to make a small contribution, go to buymeacoffee.com slash jpullman54v. Thanks.